This week, the pursuit of creativity brought me to Ali Madjan Calda, the founder and CEO of Lovewick. Lovewick is an app for couples that's all about creating new experiences and learning more about each other, all of which is rooted in insights from relationship experts, academics, therapists, and real couples. In this episode, we talk about how Ali created, tested, and launched an app without extensive coding experience, what it's like to balance all the different hats as a founder, and how using social media is essential for building an online community. My name is Ike Ajvan, and welcome to the Pursuit of Creativity podcast. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I am super stoked to talk about your app and the whole thing. So right before we jump into, I have lots of questions, lots of things that I get uh, to, uh, to, I would love to learn. Um, but if you could just give us like a rundown of like, you know, how old you are, where you live, and then like a, a one line explanation of the app that you've made. Sure. Yeah. So my name is Ali Magincalda. It's a long Italian one, kind of sounds like Magic Cauldron. <laughs> <laughs> that tends to help people with the pronunciation. I love that. Yeah. Um, I'm 31 years old or 31 years young, and I live in the outer sunset in San Francisco um, in the house that my grandfather grew up in. So that's pretty Whoa. neat. And the app that I've founded and built is called Lovewick. And the basic premise is that there's a bunch of dating apps to find somebody, but then there's virtually nothing other than therapy to make it work with someone and to continue having fun with someone. So that's where Lovewick comes in. It's a relationship wellness app for couples. I love that. That is well, one, an amazing synopsis. Thank you. Crushed it. <laughs> but uh, two, that sounds great. I mean, I've used it. I really enjoy it. Um, so my first question right off the bat is basically, where did this idea come from? I know I've, I've heard in a different interview that you uh, you had some, some studies that kind of led you down this path, um, uh, things you were doing. So if you could just kind of talk about the origin story of how this app kind of came to be. Yeah. The origin story it's a combination of all sorts of things from just like my personal life and from my academic interests. So I've always been like a bio and psych nerdy kid who like wanted to understand why people do what they do. Everything from like why someone would gossip on the playground to why on the bachelor, this person's crying, even though they said they didn't even really like the person. Like I was just like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. So um, at Stanford, I studied human behavioral biology. And a lot of that is the like neurobiological, the neurobiological sides of why we do what we do. But then also the cultural and anthropological sides of that as well. Um, and on the personal side, I feel like I was kind of a late bloomer when it came to love and romance. I didn't have my first partner until college. Um, and then after college, I was in a three-year relationship, but we very amicably split when I went to grad school in London, which hopefully we get a chance to talk about later. Yes, But definitely. that was kind of like the first time I was on the dating apps in a real way. And it was just like to be in grad school and have this opportunity to... Um, choose a dissertation topic and to be in my personal life experiencing the highs and lows of dating like over a hundred strangers, mm -hmm. men and women, different religions than me, different class backgrounds than me. Um, and trying to like make sense of really amazing firework kind of dates. And then also like being ghosted, you know, mm -hmm. on the second or third, like I was just like, Whoa, like love and tech. There's a lot here. And how can I combine that with my love for, behavioral science and kind of like understand the space better. So that's kind of like the origin stories. I'm a love nerd who also yeah. is a romantic. And I had this opportunity in grad school to like double down and actually try to understand what's going on a little bit. I love that. That's really, really cool. Um, let's dive into like that grad school picture um, because I find that really fascinating. And my, I, myself, I had studied in Manchester, England for a year for Amazing. my graduate st studies. Amazing. Yeah. And I was like, oh, whoa, that's a cool um, little connection there. But I'd love to hear about your um, your study, your study topic um, and how that played into the app, but like a little bit more in depth. Totally. Yeah. So undergrad, like I said, was human behavioral biology. And so afterwards, I was like, you know, I really don't want to be a doctor. Like, I don't care that much about how the kidney works specifically. Mm -hmm. I would much rather impact uh, a lot of people light touch than like a couple people really deep. Like, I admire all my friends who are doctors and nurses, but it just didn't fit right with me. So then I considered 
being an academic and I taught in the human biology program for a year and that was super rewarding. I love teaching. I love trying to come up with different ways to help that light bulb moment go off for people. Totally. But ultimately being a professor seemed kind of like a solitary, a more solitary kind of career than I would want. Like you're churning out research, you're writing a bunch of papers. And so to be quite honest, I, I Googled interdisciplinary design programs because I had heard of like design thinking and the D school at Stanford mm. and um, this whole philosophy of like getting an interdisciplinary group of people who have depth in these different areas work on big, hairy problems together. And one of the first Google hits was the Royal College of Art um, in London, mm, and yeah. the program's called Service Design. And uh, I had never even heard of what service design was, but essentially, you know, we hear product design. A lot of the products we use today are actually services. Like you have to be right. with a customer or a user over their whole journey of for example, transportation, like how do you map your route? How do you buy your ticket? How do you find your train car? How do you, you know, that all takes a lot of care and thought to, to map out that user journey. Um, and so I, I was like, you know what, this sounds like a really cool potential way to combine my love for psychology and biology mm -hmm. with creativity and problem solving and, and design of, of larger scale systems. Wow. Very cool. That is, yeah, I've never heard of that either, but you're right. It's like something that's clearly into like a big part of our world. Um, and it's probably, it is a part of a lot of the apps we use. Um, would you share, could you share like, the name of your dissertation? Was that, did that play directly into the app at all or yeah, was it kind of yeah. separate? No. So the, we had to choose a topic to spend 10,000 words. I think it was exploring like design, and X, so like design and nutrition, design and politics, design. And since mm. I was in this experience of going on all these dates and having all these situationships, I was like, I want to look at design and love. So I looked nice. at the design of dating apps. I looked at virtual reality porn, sex robots, this idea of like chatbot friends and therapists who we tell our problems to. Um, and it was really just an opportunity to be like, what is the lay of the land here? And if we aren't thoughtful about designing these products and services with wellness and happiness in mind, is mm -hmm. it possible that we start outsourcing all of these like deeply human needs to technology in a way that actually won't serve us long term and make us happier people? Yeah, gotcha. Wow, that is a lot to think about. I love it I though. Like that's no, it's like, heavy uh, stuff. It's heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really cool. I, I think um, not to jump ahead. I, my, my brain's like going crazy. I'm like, oh, there's so many cool things to talk about. But one thing I, I've noticed in your content, and we'll get more into the content later, but I love for you to speak to how you use your research in your app and in your content and in your videos. Because I know a lot of your TikToks, and we'll talk more about social media in a little bit, but like a lot of your TikToks definitely reference like actual studies from people that have, you know, devoted their life to being an academic or something like that. Totally. So I'd love to hear like your approach to how you like connect the everyday person to like all these academic studies. Yeah. I'm so glad that that comes across and that you noticed that because I, I think I've always felt a little insecure that like I'm not a therapist and I'm not a PhD and I'm not um, a, a dating coach even. And so it's like, where do I come into the picture and where do I get credibility talking about this kind of stuff other than like my firsthand lived experience? Right. And I think my credibility really comes from like, I have spent years and years researching, like reading the research of others, synthesizing it so that like these disparate studies make sense together to create a picture and then mm -hmm. translating that into something actionable for someone to take in their own lives to improve their life. Um, so like in college, one of my like biggest projects was it's called like writing literature reviews. Like a professor mm. oh, would yeah. be like, Hey, <laughs> find everything you can on this topic, synthesize it and like write a literature review so that like, I don't need to go out and write or read all of this thing like, and learn it for myself. Um, cause it takes a lot of time to like get the lay of the land on these things. So anyways, I, I kind of became a lit review expert. Um, and actually bizarrely, even when I was 18 and hadn't even gone to college yet, my summer internship was at, um, Emory university in, uh, Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And my 
PI was like, hey, read everything you can about Hodgkin lymphoma and write a lit review on like the epidemiology of like and the risk factors. And that actually got like published in a journal. Whoa. And so like, which is amazing. <laughs> That's like one of my coolest like brag moments is like being a published author in like the journal journal of hematology or That's, something like that is really cool. <laughs> yeah. At, like 18. But so I really do think this is my superpower of translating academic jargon into things that the average person, including myself would understand. Like it takes a lot of time to really sift through all the significance and correlations mm -hmm. versus causation and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, my, my kind of strategy there has been, make claims that are supported by research and put them into content, whether it's in the app or in TikToks, that seems really approachable and relatively lighthearted. And then just like stick the citation on there to be like, listen, this isn't just coming out of nowhere. Um, yeah. You know, there is a reason for me to be saying this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I, I highly relate my, my like growth on TikTok is directly related to my dissertation about like subtle racism and fashion and stuff and like Amazing. disseminating that information. So I'm like, yes, research, love it. And yes. you know, the accessibility bit of it, I think is so incredibly important because unless you're in the academic space, like I feel like you're like, no one sees that stuff. So um, definitely kudos to you for like incorporating it into like your app and into your content. I think it's something that if more people could do, like maybe People, or definitely people would be better off, in my opinion, to like hear the, all this great work that people have done that's just kind of sitting behind paywalls and exactly. in academic yeah, research places. The paywall, the paywalls, the jargon. And then, you know, I, I do understand you have to have some clickbaity headlines for people to read stuff, but some studies are just extrapolated so far beyond what was said like there, there were so many articles about like we've fallen in love with our iPhones like our brains mm. light up the same way when we're in love something like that and I was just kind of like well I'd also like to see if it lights up that way when you're eating a chicken nugget or when you're doing yeah. like <laughs> is it really that we've fallen in love with our iPhones or is, it, is there something there about the, the dopamine hit of a notification versus you know I don't know and so I, I also I want people to Trust that what I'm saying is rooted in something, but also not to trust everything that is supported by science or supported by research blindly totally. because like they can be used so out of context. Um, and I, and I see that a lot, I feel like. Yeah. People doing the research to kind of support their claim without like, and it's just so narrow and it's just like, come on, you can like, there's more to this. It's not to your point. It's like, it's not just the iPhone chicken nuggets do it too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I love that. Uh, I want to keep going down this path of like jumping from college era to now Lovewick era. So, yeah. um, my next question would be, uh, your app, like I've used it. It's great. I, I love it. How did you go from idea to actual functioning app? Like, do you have coding experience? Did you like outsource? Like, how did you, what's the, in, in the most basic and summarized terms, like, how did you go from like, this is a good idea. This is something people want to like an actual app. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I scale back all the way, I'm trying to like, I read a couple things about like, not a couple, I read a lot about the psych psychology of love, the correlates of staying together versus getting div divorced. And I kind of created this framework of like, if a app was able to help you feel um, more understood, more appreciative and more excited, I think it would really make a difference for your relationship. So like, mm -hmm. and that's based on the triangular theory of love. So I was like, all right, there's like kind of my framework for like, what I would build feature sets on top of. I want them to respond to those kind of core needs. And then in terms of the features, I had my little iPad and, and um, I pencil thingy, and mm -hmm. I was starting to wireframe like what an interface for drawing these question cards could be, what an interface for um, anniversary reminders could, could be, but it was kind of still pretty big and all over the place. And I had many, many iterations of like first, showing these wireframes to people and just getting their gut reactions of like, is this something that even sounds remotely interesting? All right. If it's interesting, how can I iterate a little bit? So that's in a nicer place. Once it's in a little bit of a nicer place, people say and do very differently, right? Mm, they could mm -hmm. say this is really lovely, but then do they actually behaviorally follow up with that? And so I think it is really important to build some kind of prototype before you go sink a bunch of money into like a native app. Like that's, 
that's big. So totally. my first kind of step there was um, a Facebook messenger bot, actually, oh. that like um, this guy who is who is also studying, getting his master's in London, um, helped us with our group project on this. And it was just a very simple decision tree. We had, you know, six decks of, of cards or something. And if someone clicked sex and affection, it would return an affection related question. And then you'd see, do they ping the bot again? after doing that like and then we added in the layer of all right maybe they're pinging for questions now if we start fake aiing date ideas do people follow up and and try to get more out of that so like what's the lowest um expense and money you can put into testing mm -hmm. key assumptions around like would people inherently even find this valuable so like the facebook messenger bot was kind of the first step then after that because that's a very limited um functionality. Um, and there's, you know, the system that it's in is obviously its own beast. Um, yeah. <laughs> then my uncle helped me make a, just a really mobile friendly web experience mm -hmm. where you could draw cards and, um, flip through decks and things like that. And again, I was like, I think I, I used my friends, um, like a hundred dollar meta or Facebook ads spend yeah. to get people to come and at least see it. And it's like, once they see it and use it, do they come back? How often do they use it? What are the demographics of these people? Like, how could I better understand what need this is fill fulfilling for people? And only after that point, did I start even looking into like building a proper app and yeah. to your point or to your question, I took like an intro CS class in college. I did a Coursera class, um, mm -hmm. Python for everybody, but there is no way I would call myself a coder. Um, and I didn't really want, I had already done two lower fidelity kind of things that I didn't want to do a no code personally at this level. I was yeah. feeling pretty confident about the MVP feature set. Um, and so I asked a bunch of friends, um, about experiences they'd had with freelance or contractor developers, um, dev shops, mm -hmm. interviewed a few, and then found one that like I really, really liked. And Amit, who has been the developer on the project, um, has now been on it for three years, whereas the longest oh, wow. project he had worked on previously was like two months because yeah. he wanted that variety. But like we just worked together really, really well, and it was a great way to get the app off the ground without committing to, you know, two, two years salary for somebody and pulling them away from a job they already have. And if you can do that, that's so great. But I just didn't really feel comfortable at that point. And this wasn't a product that I felt was going to sink or swim on its immense technical um, difficulty. Right. Yeah. Amazing. That is, I mean, that's quite the journey. I love the, the, like the iterations of testing things and like trying it in different formats, but also if you could speak to, cause I know I have, I struggle with this where I'm like, I can do it all. There's YouTube. I can learn everything. Like, yeah. how did you, like, at what point, like, how did you get to the point where you're like, you know what, let's bring in someone that can actually do this. It's not like quote unquote, it's not worth my time to like learn how to do all the coding. Yeah. If I'm being totally honest, I've never wanted to learn how to code. I think for people who have that desire, this would be a great, like bringing your own idea to fruition would be an awesome way mm -hmm. to learn. But it's just never been something that I've been naturally interested in. And I feel like my spikes are in these other areas, um, like all the user research and interviewing. And, um, you know, I, I taught myself how to use Sketch and Figma and start doing the visual, the visual design parts yeah. of it. And I was just kind of like, to make this an experience that isn't super, super janky, where I'll lose trust with people. I need someone who has been doing this for dec not decades, for years and years, mm -hmm. and like knows how to build it well. Because I didn't want it to fail, not because the concept wasn't great, not because like the insights weren't great, but because like the tech itself was a bad experience. That would just be really disappointing. Totally. Yeah, no, that's really good. I mean, like, I, I love that. Like, I just didn't want to. And it, <laughs> and, and that's super honest. I feel like most people like can't, don't think about it that way. So I commend you on that. Cause I think like myself, I'm like, I love like having control. So it's cool mm -hmm. that you were like, you know what? <laughs> let's make sure this is done right. And like, let's go for it. So that's, that's but awesome. You know what? I, I love having control too. I have so as a solo founder and, you know, we're a team of four right now. Like I still wear a lot of hats, like 
basically all the non-developer hats. Yeah. And it's even hard to do all those things well. And so, yeah, I, I see coding as like kind of learning an entire new language. And Mm -hmm. like, if someone's already fluent in it, um, and I have no interest in learning it. Yeah. Beyond a base, like I said, I took a coding class. I did the Python for at least I know if then like Boolean kind of statements and and how to yeah how files are transferred via FTP and little little things like that that I learned in the past made it so that I could at least communicate and be a good product manager with my engineers, but not be the actual engineer. No, that's great. I feel like that's I feel like that's the spot to be like right yeah. there. Um, that's awesome. Let's let's dive a little deeper into the app. So great. there's a lot of different features. I think it's there's so many different things. There's like like you said, the date ideas and the the question cards and like the repository for saving things. Mm-hmm. Um, could you just talk about each of those a little bit more in depth so the yeah. listeners can get a good idea if they haven't used it yet, but they should totally download it while they're listening to this? <laughs> you, you totally should. And it's a hundred percent free. So there's literally no downside to at least trying it. And a lot of people are like, but you know, what if I'm in a really new relationship or, um, I'm single and I'm like, honestly, I was single for three years during this journey. And I used love it questions on my dates all the time. Mm, now mm-hmm. it did come up very organically because people are like, Oh, what do you do for work? Yeah. Um, so, th- but you know, questions like what was your favorite way to play as a kid? What's a dish from your family or culture that's important to you? Um, if you found a hundred dollars on the ground and had to spend it on yourself, what would you spend it on? Like right now, those are fun things to talk about even very early on in a relationship. So don't feel like you have to be super wifed up or partnered up uh, in order to try it. So, um, the features of the app, there's a lot more now than there was two years ago when it Mm -hmm. launched. Um, but the basic premise is I want people to be having better conversations that lead to better experiences that lead to memories that lead to gratitude. That's kind Mm -hmm. of like the, the wheel there. And, um, so the, the discovery cards are these open-ended question cards, much like you were mentioning um, before we got on the call Valentine's Day and how you have these physical decks of cards that you yep. can talk about with your partner. Um, it's taking that, but really digitizing it and giving what I hope feels like a more personalized pathway because the physical cards, they don't know if you want to have children or not have children. Mm-hmm. They don't know if you've been together for 10 years versus 10 months. Um And so there are questions specifically for interracial couples, specifically for queer couples. And these were all important things to me because I've been in these kinds of relationships myself and then also just see the changing demographic of America and of relationships. So, yeah, the open ended question game is to get you to experience self-disclosure. That's like the academic term for it. But when you share your beliefs, your values, your past experiences, your hopes, your dreams, it's associated with higher relationship satisfaction, lower rates of breakups, um, and sometimes even like more desire. So that's like the nerdy bit of it. But Mm -hmm. in actuality, you're just pulling questions one by one that you can either read aloud, put the phone down and have a real conversation offline. Or if you're long distance and one of you has a late night shift or you're in different time zones, sometimes people will write their answer and then their partner will come in and read it and then write their own response. So that's the question game bit. The next part is the, um, I would, I call it community ideas, but essentially Mm -hmm. it's a library of date ideas and sweet things to do for each other, things to try in the bedroom that are crowdsourced from other couples, also written by me, but also like really curated. I don't just accept any old idea that comes (laughs) in because I don't want people to have to hunt for like lots of duplicates of things. But so you start seeing things there that piggyback off of the conversations you've been having or are seasonal. Like for February, there were ideas um, like having a pink and red meal for Valentine's day, like making beet pancakes or, um, pink cinnamon rolls or something like that. Um, so that's getting, hopefully getting couples to get out of their routines. It's so nice to be comfortable in our relationships, but novelty and self-expansion growing Mm -hmm. in some way, learning something new is again, associated with higher relationship quality. And also, um, you're more likely to have sex or be intimate on a day that you experience self-expansion. So that's kind of like the little nugget 
under there. And I think the barrier for a lot of people is feeling not creative or feeling like they don't Mm. have enough time or feeling like they don't have the budget. And so having filters for those kinds of things lowers the friction to you actually shutting off Netflix potentially and like doing something else, even though, you know, we get tired. Um, totally. It's nice to have just a down night with your partner too. Um, and then the last major piece I would say, uh, is forget me nots. That's the reminder. So the way Mm -hmm. your partner likes their coffee, their clothing sizes. So when you get them gifts, you don't have to ask, Oh, what size shirt are you again? Or, um, also dates like by, by dates, I mean, the date of your first date, the date of your engagement, the date you Mm -hmm. moved in together, for example, so that when those come around, you have uh, another opportunity for like, yeah, cherishing that special milestone in your relationship. And then all of that kind of weaves together into your home tab, which is a memories timeline that's just for you. So anytime you do a date or uh, a forget me not is coming up, it kind of like lives there Mm -hmm. and you can build a digital scrapbook that's kind of just for the two of you. And that's to cultivate appreciation and gratitude in the relationship. I love that. I, I, each, each part of each one of the, it's all so well thought out, like the Thank whole you. thing. <laughs> it's so great. Like even the forget me nots, right? Like I, before I, I found you on TikTok, I, my girlfriend and I have like a, a, a Apple note with just like a bunch of uh, milestones and things like that. So when I like found the app and I was like, oh, there's a whole thing just for this. This is perfect. Yes. So um, yeah, so that's just really, really cool. Uh, and before we move on, I just want to ask another question in regards to um, the the people using your app, because I do mm-hmm. find that really interesting. And I, I heard in another interview you did um, that there was a lot of research and, uh, and to, you already said there's personal experience with um, people of many different backgrounds and different um, ethnicities and different sexualities. So how did you um, basically make the content? to for it to work for all these Mm. different types of people Mm. or is it like there's a lot of content and then it to your point like sorts itself out to show certain things to certain types of people yeah i have interviewed at least a hundred people probably 200 sometimes together as a couple sometimes individuals Mm -hmm. and i have specifically like i made kind of a matrix to make sure that i was hitting all these different personas of people. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't mean that one person, I never tried to speak to just one person of a certain demographic group, but like you want to, let's say, talk to at least five people before making uh, an assumption that that's how all people of that group would feel. But talking to um, interracial couples, for example, um, this idea that like you're your child might come out not looking like one of you Mm -hmm. and um, you might get mistaken as the babysitter or something like that. That was an insight that I had, I I had thought about based on my own interracial relationships, but was also um, reiterated in others. So I was like, all right, I should write a couple questions about like, how can couples have those conversations Mm -hmm. well before that day comes so that they feel really comfortable. And, and in terms of like um, teaching partner who doesn't know how to deal with different textured hair, for example, like right. how do you bring these conversations up for people? Um, as early, not, not like on day two of dating, obviously, yeah. <laughs> but make it like a normal thing. That's part of your dialogue as a couple and building a strong foundation together. So, like I said, I kind of had this matrix of, um, age, like I wanted to talk to big age gap couples. I wanted mm-hmm. to talk to interracial couples. I wanted to talk to inner race, inner faith couples, um, queer couples, obviously Paul, I, I interviewed quite a few polyamorous, um, mm-hmm. people, whether they had like multiple dyadic relationships or they were in a triad or something like that. I really just, I wanted to leave no rock left unturned Yeah, and make it as inclusive of an experience as I could knowing my limitations as a white pretty affluent, like grew up in Palo Alto, uh, went to Stanford. Like that's a very specific archetype and life experience. And so I wanted to make sure that, um, I was diligent about learning about other life experiences because these questions should be representative of, of all sorts of relationships, not just the ones that I've had. Totally. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really awesome. I think, yeah, to your, to like the point of what we were talking about earlier, but like academic research and things like that, like, I feel like so many p- things are so siloed within the, the, the person's um, experience. So it's cool to hear that you like went out of your way to 
explore all the different types of things for an app that like love is universal, right? So like an app that can go across all these different types of people. I, 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 it's really cool that you went above and beyond and, 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 and did that. So shout Thank out you. to you in that regard. And just, you know, academics in general, the sample size has been very white, very middle class or upper middle class college towns. Like that's where sample sets for psychological studies come from. So like you definitely can't rely just on mm-hmm. that for like, the, the breadth of experience that people have today in their relationships. Absolutely. Totally. That's a really good point. Um, that that's awesome. That, that that's so exciting to see how it's grown over the last, you said two years, you launched in 2020. Yes. Yeah. Um, right towards the end of 2020. So like beginning of 2021. Yeah. Gotcha. And, um, so I mentioned before that I I found your uh, you and your your company on TikTok and I've seen a lot of your content. So how has social media played a part in promoting your app? Is that like your main way of promoting it? Do you like run? You mentioned that you did some like Facebook ad testing early on. Um, how yeah? How does social media play into that? Yeah. What's interesting is that I haven't done um, like paid. Facebook related ads since. So that was like really just to get those initial cold start kind of people to like inform the design of the app, people who weren't my friends, people who weren't my parents mm-hmm. and family members. Yeah. Um, Cause it's really important obviously to get outside of your circles. TikTok came as like a super surprise blessing to me, to be quite honest. Um, I knew I felt very confident in the app that the app that I had built, even as an MVP, when it launched in 2021, that there would be people who really found it valuable, Mm -hmm. but finding those people and getting their eyeballs on is expensive. And so my first strategy actually was to start replying to Reddit posts about relationships. It's a good call. (laughs) Um, Very one-on-one because, you know, Reddit moderators do not want spam, which I completely Mm -hmm. respect, but like in long distance um, relationship threads, a lot of people were saying like, Hey, what are some dates that we can do long distance? Hey, what are some ways that we can spice up our phone calls? I feel like we're just kind of bantering back and forth about how was your day? Oh, good. How was your day? Good. And we had already been up on the minutia of the day because we text each other so much. So like these were very acute pain points that people were having such that they turned to the internet for answers. And I was like, I made this thing to help this kind of problem. Yeah. So like, if you wouldn't mind, Hey, I built this free app. It's called Lovewick. Like go check it out. I would say that's how I got my first like 50 or so users. It's not a scalable way to acquire users, obviously. Yeah. But, um, when you're at the very, very start of a journey, I think the more one-on-one interaction you can have, the more you'll learn, the faster you'll learn. Um, because if they just kind of become disembodied users Mm -hmm. too early on, you're just not going to be on the pulse of how people are really using the product or, or how, what they really need. So yeah, Reddit was kind of like the first tranche. Then, um, it was, I think it was the beginning of January, maybe a couple weeks into January and Valentine's day was coming up Valentine's day, 2021. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh man, I'm like, this is a great opportunity to get eyeballs on, but I just, I'm not trustworthy enough for like outlets to talk about me yet. Mm-hmm. Um, And I, over Christmas and Thanksgiving, had seen all of my little cousins. I'm the oldest of nine on one side and five on the other. And I was like, everyone's on this thing called TikTok. Um, They've all been on Snapchat for a while. And I kind of wrote that off. But like, fair enough. (laughs) I... (laughs) <laughs> I I didn't even have a Twitter at the time. So I was kind of like, oh man, I don't know anything about this world. I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a social media noob, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But when I saw them using TikTok to like learn things, um, and it was like just way more than just entertainment. And it was way, it was not the social comparison type of so- social media that I was accustomed to. It made me realize that if you create interesting enough content, it's basically a free 10 second, 15 second ad. And since I don't have ad spend, like I might as well, even though it seems very scary, get on TikTok and start creating content related to stuff that's in the app and see if I can get a couple more people to try it out. And 
I felt super cringy pointing to bubbles in the of text in oh, the yeah. sky. And I did not tell any of my friends to go <laughs> like my stuff because I just didn't even want them to see it. Um, but I think like my fifth video got like 20,000 views and I was like, whoa. And I had no followers. I had like 10 followers. So you, yeah. you were like, okay. And then I think around my 20th, I don't really remember, but one got a million views and that was about ah. the topic of housework and sex. And I was like, okay, this is very interesting. Um, there's definitely potential here. And even though the videos about research don't have as high of conversion, cause it's not like, Hey, here's this app. It mm -hmm. builds credibility with me as a person. It gets followers. And then in subsequent ones, when I have a screenshot of the app or if I have the logo in the corner, like it just kind of dribbles that in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so really TikTok became my main acquisition channel, like for the last two years, I don't think it will be forever. Uh, it already, I'm sure you've experienced this as a creator, but like, it's so much more saturated now than oh. it was two year, uh, one year ago, two years ago, like going viral wild. now, at least for me seems, you know, 10 X harder than it was back totally. then. hundred percent. Um, and so I don't want to become super, super reliant on it, but it is an, a, it's a really amazing opportunity to understand what people are talking about, what resonates with people and get free eyeballs on these things that you've built or these ideas that you have. Absolutely. That, that's really great. Yeah. And I, I mean, TikTok, it's cool because in my, like I spend all day on TikTok because it's like my job quite literally <laughs> almost. Um, but it's, it's awesome to see business businesses find unique ways to utilize it, to get their message out. And I love the fact that you kind of lead with like just helpful information. I mean, it's kind of like a standard content marketing strategy, but in video form and you like reply to a lot of people and stitch a lot of things. So I, I think it's really uh, impressive that you can lead with that research that like is the foundation of your app and people are responding well to it. So that's really, really cool. Um, yeah, thank you. for this is a question I have though. Uh, a lot of founders or people that are building things that aren't necessarily social media related, related don't like social media. So mm -hmm. where do you fall on that scale? Are you like, I like making videos or are you more toward, I have to make these videos and it's something I'll do if I, but yeah. if I didn't have to, I wouldn't. <laughs> That's a good question. I think I have found it really fun. It, like there have been sides of it that are really fun. Mm -hmm. Um, seeing, a viral video about something and be like, Oh my God, I have a response to this that like, it would be fun if people like were also able to chime in and share their responses, but feeling like I have to crank them out on a certain schedule on a certain cadence. And if I don't do that, it affects my business. Like that's a lot of pressure. And when mm -hmm. that pressure kicks on, that's not fun. And sometimes you also have days where like, you just are not in the mood to be on camera. Like, I think a lot of people who fell into being influencers, it's a, it's amazing that like they had one or two videos go viral and then became like a personality that people wanted to follow. But I think I would, I would, I hope that they're all mentally doing okay because I think the then pressure that that spontaneous, lovely thing that happened does for your life um, can be a lot and can really wear on you. So yeah, I think I just kind of set try to set some boundaries for myself because mm -hmm. as much as I do enjoy being on camera, I do enjoy performing. I was in a dance group in college. Like I, I like being up on a stage, yeah. um, feeling pushed out onto a stage does not feel really great. That's a really good way of putting it. Uh, I, I, I kindly walk myself onto the stage, but pushing like getting pushed on, not so much fun. Yeah. Um, that's really good. Uh, and I, I, I totally agree. I like, I, I, that pressure, I feel like no matter how big or small you get a little bit of something, you're like, Oh, I got to keep doing this every day for the rest of mm -hmm. time. And that can be very, very stressful. Um, totally. so um, a couple more questions here. Um, cause I'm curious, this relationship app that you've made is obviously, um, all about love and relationships and like communication and things like that. Um, have you seen, or has it affected your personal life at all, whether that's your romantic or friendships or family, um, how has that played into it or is it, has it helped? Has it hurt anything like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's two pieces. Um, there's the piece of 
being a founder and like how that affects your mental health. And then there's a piece of like working on love and relation, love and relationships every day. Um, like I said, I was single for the vast majority of building Lovewick, and that was really hard. I think mm-hmm. it gave me a bit more of an unbiased perspective, honestly, when I was in interviews, because I wasn't putting and projecting my own current relationship onto what these people were saying, but also going on first, second, and third dates and talking about what I do for work and feeling like a little doubt of imposter syndrome where it's like, you're making this app to help couples stay in love, but like, you're not actually in a relationship. Right. I don't know if people were thinking that, but like, I worried that people were thinking about that. And it was just kind of a layer of anxiety, honestly, that it was not fun to, to cope with. And then the solo, solo founder whole journey of being a little bit of, you know, wanting to do it all myself, also not having the resources to hire people that I would really trust to do things as well or better than me or with the care that I would, it really wore on me, um, very high peaks, very low valleys. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really lucky that I started seeing a therapist weekly three years ago and I still see her today. I know that's not something that's feasible for everybody, Mm -hmm. but, um, creating a support network around you and it's just been totally invaluable to me to have that. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That's Oh, that, sorry. Oh, and one more thing. Sure. I am in a relationship now. I met my partner on Hinge. And Hinge, same. Yeah. And like literally <laughs> yeah. all of my friends. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and he like loves what I do. And we, I had never used Lovick with a partner before. It is so fun to see him add date ideas to our wish list, to add mm-hmm. memories. Like it just like warms my heart that I built this thing that now I am using with someone. And then yeah. like, it really gives me butterflies. So I'm really, I'm really happy right now. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, yeah. Amazing. Uh, this Thank is you. the day after Valentine's day for anyone that's listening to this. So uh, love is in the air and everyone's love happy. Is in the air. It's yeah. lovely. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, uh, on this show, I love to, before we end, I love to give the, the guests an opportunity to brag about something. I think mm-hmm. the world can be, kind of the world is really hard right now in general so i do mm. love to make some space for the for the guests to kind of like boast a little bit brag about something that they're excited about or just share yeah or just share something they're excited about so let's uh, do you have anything you'd like to tell the world i mean in general i'm i'm, I'm just really proud of what i've built like it's been a long slog and it'll continue to be a long slog but like the the amazing gift of having conversations with people that turn into ideas that then I can turn into features in like two weeks because I don't have to go through anybody else. And Mm. it's just like a really wonderful, powerful sense of being that I really appreciate. And so the fact that I built this thing, it has 4.9 stars in the app store, like no fake paid reviews or anything. Yeah. And over 250,000 people wow. have tried it. Like it just, yeah, I feel really badass about that. And, um, I, I need to take opportunities to celebrate that. Cause when you're on a very small team or a team of one, you don't want to just like celebrate into the echo chamber. It's nice to celebrate with other people. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really cool. And that's one of the reasons why I love asking this question because like, it's like, that's amazing. That's so awesome. Um, and very Thank exciting. You. Um, so, okay, two last questions. Um, okay. Where would you want Lovewick to go in the next five years? Um, you said it's been roughly two-ish years. Mm-hmm. So a little bit down the line, if you could make your dreams come true, which I'm sure is in the cards, but what yeah. would you, where would you want it to end up? I would want Lovewick to be a household name and known like hinge and bumble and tinder but like not for the dating chunk for the chunk after for like Mm -hmm. the building a life together um and i would like this idea of relationship mindfulness and being intentional in your relationship to be something that everyone is aware of and wants to do and doesn't feel like oh my relationship has to be really struggling or something has to be really wrong We're, we're fixing something like No, with our friendships, with our families, with our careers, you don't just start trying when stuff is really bad. Like you, you work towards things, you build things. It feels good to build things. 
So yeah, love with being a household name, reaching millions of people, me growing a much bigger team so that I don't have to do all of these things average. And I have like superstars in all these different areas that are like really support me. And I, I would like to be much more collaborative than I am today. That's kind of the, the dream that I have. I love that. That, that. That's great. I mean, that sounds like a, a, a fun future for Lovewick. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so the last question, I'm hoping that there were some people that were super inspired by this conversation. I feel like I could keep going and diving into different things, but I'll, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, what advice, if someone was inspired by this conversation, would you give people? Um, let's say like three things doesn't have to be super long, could be even just a sentence. But if someone's like, I have an idea or maybe I want to like make an app or if I am building any sort of business, basically, what mm -hmm. kind of advice would you give them? Um, I think I heard this from Tinks, who probably heard it from someone else, but like follow your curiosity. Mm -hmm. Like just when you see something that you're like, oh, that sounds interesting go explore it. There's no way I would have predicted when I started college that I would be the founder of an app helping couples stay in love. Like absolutely no way. But at all of these little points, I was just kind of following my curiosity and saying yes to putting myself out there a little bit. So follow your curiosity is one. I think the other one is fall in love with problems, not solutions. Ooh, um, that's good. A lot of people think they already have the right answer to something or they try to retrofit something they've made to then fix a problem. And it's like, I fell in love with the problem of staying, like growing and staying in love. That's such a multifaceted problem that I can work on that for my whole life and be like, real, like never get to the end of it. And society is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think you'll build better products and you'll enjoy your work more if you fall in love with the problem and not the solution, because the solution might change right? You know, next week. Um, and then number three, I think it is really this idea of, of a brain trust, like coming, finding a group of people, whether it's your roommate, your partner, a family member, ideally all of the above, mm -hmm. um, but not so broad that then you don't really feel like you can go to anybody for help. Like you want people that you don't feel bad asking for help, yeah. um, to support you on whatever journey you set out on, whether it's like founding a company or building a product or just like living your dang life like this we've really lost in a lot of places the sense of community and of a village and i just think we are not as well as a society because we've lost that sense of of closeness and community so when you meet someone who you just feel like you guys get really get each other like follow up and try to become their friend. Or, or when you think of something, a memory with someone, send them a text and say like, I, I just thought about this memory. Like do what you can to stay connected to people in ways that feel authentic to you. Um, Cause yeah, you're definitely not alone in this. And there are a lot of people who want to help when you ask for it, but if you don't ask for it, you won't know. That is great advice. All three of those pieces. Thank you for sharing. I hope that further inspires the listeners to get out there and meet people and do some great things, follow their curiosity. Um, but before we end here, well, first off, thank you for joining me for this awesome interview. This has been really, really great. If you could let the people know where they can find you, Lovewick's the name of the app, of course, but what, uh, what are your socials? Uh, with Lovewick on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And the app is published in the U.S. App Store and Play Store, but you can email me if you're out of the country for beta access. Amazing. All right. Well, I think that's it. Again, thank you for joining me. This has been an awesome conversation. Um, and I'm excited to, you know, keep diving into Lovewick and planning dates and answering questions and all sorts of cool things like that. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening to episode three of the Pursuit of Creativity podcast. If you enjoyed Allie's story and got some value from it, be sure to share it with a friend, leave a rating or a review. It really helps us out. For more insightful content, be sure to check out the Believe Divergent Instagram or check out BelieveDivergent.com. Once again, thank you for being a part of this whole fun experiment. My name is Aiki Ajvan, and as usual, stay optimistic. Better days are coming.